All right, well, I'm going to start with a brief introduction um, tonight. I, I want to say good evening um, to the Napa Valley Unified School District community. We are so grateful and excited about being here this evening um, and hosting uh, Dr. Emma Seppala, the author of The Happiness Track, who is going to um, be sharing with us tonight, I think, some great information for our parents and families. Um, before we get started with Dr. Seppala, and we want to maximize the time that we have her here with all of her expertise that she's going to be sharing um, as a writer, a teacher, professor, author, um, speaker, um, I want to give the NVUSD community a little bit of background around how we got here um, uh, and where we're going to continue to go with our um, community engagement events uh, focused on authors, last year on children authors, and this year um, uh, adding an additional component to our programming um, as we continue to build community and connection in the Napa Valley Unified School District around now offering um, authors and speakers for our parent community as well. So my name is Dr. Rosana Musetti, and I am the proud superintendent of schools here in the Napa Valley Unified School District. Um, I uh, wanted to, like I stated um, last year during COVID, we were reaching for ways to sort of bring our community together um, on behalf of our students while simultaneously focusing on some of the priorities and um, efforts that we thought were gonna benefit our students, especially during these uh, extraordinary times that we've been living in, um, you know, leading up to the pandemic and persisting through the pandemic. And, and the pandemic that continues to sort of evolve and, and reshape and shape our lives. And so last year we um, had, you know, many of our families joined us for um, the author series of children's books uh, that we hosted throughout the course of the year. We had several evenings um, with authors from all over the country who'd written children's books. And that was our attempt of bringing um, community together um, around literature because number one, we're focused on community and connection. We know that in order for schools to thrive, community and connection among our students, family and staff is absolutely critical. And so as we dealt with the forces of the pandemic, we thought that hosting nights for our students would be a phenomenal way to bring them together as we were again, persisting through the, the, the challenges of COVID-19. Um, those events were incredibly successful, uh, got lots of positive feedback. It was extraordinary to hear students be excited and inspired by writers and, and authors um, who were writing children's books about topics that were completely relevant to their lives um, from elementary school to middle school and, and high school as well. And then this year, um, so that programming will continue. I wanna let all of our NVUSD families and parents know that that programming will continue. And we're, we're currently scheduling um, more um, children's author evenings for the 21-22 school year. So we're excited to announce that. So that's where we're, we've been and where we will continue to go as an organization because we want our students to really get inspired around um, reading and thinking, uh, learning, and growing through this experience of books. And we think authors can be a tremendous source of inspiration for our children in that way. And our, our board of trustees is, are, are very much behind this idea of um, promoting uh, reading, reading and literacy for our young people. And in reflecting around that success of last year, we thought that an additional a layer of programming that would be phenomenal for our NVUSD families would also be to think about our parents and our parents um, reading, learning, thinking, growing, and also being inspired by thought leaders and writers who are writing about topics that are relevant to them, just as you know, adults navigating the wild circumstances that we're all living in today, but specifically also in their roles as parents, right? We're an educational um, institution. Um, the Napa Valley Unified School District knows that the success of our students is very contingent upon the adults that work in the system, but we also know that we can maximize that success when we are in continuous partnership with our parents and families. And so we wanted to add this additional component um, of inspiration also for our parents and families, because we know that as your 
children navigate school, it's important for you as parents to also be inspired. So our parent education series last year was an attempt at doing that. And we wanted to weave in um, this promotion of, of thought leadership and um, reading um, you know, books and texts that might inspire you as a parent in service to the students that we serve as the Napa Valley Unified School District. And so that's a little bit of context setting and background um, as I have the pleasure to introduce our first author um, as part of this educative series for, for parents, again, Dr. Emma Seppala. Um, Dr. Seppala and I um, actually um, have a, a professional connection now, uh, which is one of the reasons that she's um, launching this new layer of programming for us. Um, I have been uh, participating starting this summer. I was selected for a, a fellowship uh, for public for leaders um, across the country in public education at the Yale School of Management. Um, and I've had my um, first uh, um, module of learning um, at, at the Yale School of Management. And Dr. Seppala was one of the professors that was included in the leadership development a week that I had the pleasure of participating in alongside um, superintendents from across the country. And I learned so much. I got really inspired. I um, heard her speak a handful of times, read the happiness track, the book that she's going to uh, walk us through and talk to us about, and, um, and found her to be really inspirational that we even invited her to come um, uh, last month and speak to all of our leaders at this critical juncture um, in, in this moment in time as we all kind of struggle with you know, how do we continue to find and seek happiness as we are dealing with um, layers and layers of challenges that none of us could have, been, could have ever have imagined um, that have been really you know, forced, of a, forced upon us, thrusted upon us um, due to a global worldwide pandemic. And so um, lots of lessons for uh, me as a professional when I first interacted with Dr. Seppala. I think our leaders found um, her segment and uh, 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 element of, of our leadership, um, our two days of our leadership retreat, um, this segment to be really inspiring as well. And we thought it would be great to kind of talk about the content and, that Dr. Seppala brings to the table through the lens um, of, of the parent lens, right? And what how, how important your happiness is in order to ensure that your students, your children that we serve, um, are also able to um, not only um, survive, but thrive and succeed. Um, and what does success really look like, right? Um, as, we, as we navigate these complicated times. So I'm gonna welcome on behalf of the Napa Valley Unified School District, Dr. Seppala, who I know is a little under the weather, right, Dr. Seppala? Emma? Oh, we can't- we'll be, you know, blowing my nose periodically. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay. Well, it's all part of our new world order. Um, right. <laughs> up and showing up, um, you know, we're, with with uh, some physical challenges at times, especially as, as the uh, pandemic persists. But um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, Emma, why don't you start out by just telling us what was your general motivation for writing this book, The Happiness Track? Yeah. Um, so I grew up in France, uh, Paris, France, which, you know, a lot of people idealize as this beautiful place, which it is. Um, but it's interesting to grow up there because um, despite French people really having everything, you know, free school, free medicine, you know, very 30 hour work weeks, everything you would want, I guess, French food. <laughs> Um, there was just this general sense of negativity growing up, sort of always complaining. If you have some spend some time in Paris, you'll see that that's kind of how you connect with people is through complaining. Oh, as a child growing up in that kind of negative atmosphere, you start to think, oh, I guess life is just really dark and happiness isn't really there. It's, it's sort of strange. And when I came to the U.S. for college, I realized, oh, wow, like people don't really tolerate complaints here. And I kind of like that. Like they're more positive. I really like that. But then I saw another side to U.S. culture that was, um, I thought of it the same because people run run a lot in the U.S., which is obviously a healthy habit. But and in France, they don't exercise very much, right? So, but I used to rem think, where are they running? And that was more metaphorically. Obviously, the exercise is healthy and excellent, but Americans metaphorically are also always seemed to me always to be running, 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 trying to prove, trying to gain, trying to achieve, and I saw suffering in that. 
uh, quite a bit of suffering. And I thought, okay, there's something that's missing he here as well. Like why, why, why this running? And then I lived in China for a couple of years after college. And I saw people who were destitute really, uh, you know, multiple, multiple generations all sleeping, sleeping, living in the same room, you know, with broken windows because that's just what they had. And there was just so much gratitude and resilience despite really harsh living conditions. And I, I realized, I guess happiness is a lot more to do with your state of mind than your circumstances. And that really got me thinking, what is it? You know, not to say that everyone in China is happy, obviously, um, but I came back with that sort of intent of studying that. And I first studied East Asian languages and um, cultures to really kind of get into sort of the philosophy of um, East Asian practices. And then um, decided to go into psychology and really studied the science of happiness, and especially what can we do to make people feel more connected, to help them be more resilient, to, to help them be more fulfilled. You know, the world promises you many things. You will be happy if you make a certain amount of money, have a certain partner, look a certain way, achieve a certain thing. But look, look at the people who have those things. Are they happy? Are they blissful? Not really. No. I mean, the truth of the matter is one of the things, most simple points that I've seen is just that, you know, the state of your, the, the quality of your life has everything to do with the state of your mind, not with your external circumstances. So uh, the example I often give is you could be, you know, at the beach, finally, you got to have a post pandemic vacation, you're like on the beach is awesome sunset, your feet are sinking in the warm sand. But you just got in a fight with someone on the phone or someone you travel there with and all of a sudden you're miserable. It doesn't matter that you're on the beach at sunset in a gorgeous place because you're still miserable. Why? Because your state of mind is miserable, right? On the other hand, you could be, you know, stuck in an uncomfortable situation here. You could be on another lockdown or you could be stuck in traffic, but you just got some great news, some wonderful news. You got a raise, you got a, you're pregnant, you're whatever, right? Something beautiful just happening. Uh, your sister got engaged, you know, and uh, you're, you're just so happy. And it doesn't matter that you're in traffic. It doesn't matter that you're in lockdown. Internally, you're happy. So that really got me thinking, what are the things we can do to manage our state of mind? Because especially in this crazy, crazy time, when all of the world around us has been sort of falling apart and nothing is predictable anymore, there's only one thing we can hold on to. And that is the state of our mind. And what can we do about a state of mind? Because the external world has never governed our well-being, although we thought it did. But there's, and there's nothing much we can do about our environment, but there's so much we can do about our state of mind and be resilient no matter what's going on. So that's what got me motivated to share. Thank you so much for kind of sharing your journey and, and the, the motivational journey that got you to producing the book. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about sort of the science of happiness and getting into the space of, of content and kind of some of the big themes from the research um, as you've studied this topic and, you know, the only thing that's within our sphere of control is our, is our, is our mindset, no matter what our external circumstances may be. What, can you tell us a little bit about some of the major themes in your research? Yeah, and there's so much that we could talk about, but let's start with this. So you can think of happiness in one of two ways. There's the hedonic happiness and there's eudaimonic. So what does that mean? Hedonic happiness is the pleasures of the senses. It could be, you know, food, sex, drugs, rock and roll, like all of the sens sensory pleasures you can imagine. But in that category also, uh, also you can put reputation, you can put attention, you can put fame, you can put wealth, and you can put power. All of those things give you a high and it is, this is what it is. It's a high, it's a dopamine high. So it's like releasing chemicals in your brain quickly and it gives you a high, similarly to a drug, really. The interesting thing with that form of happiness and that form of happiness is what a lot of marketers use or a lot of products use, right? They're like, oh, you're gonna take, you know, take Facebook, like, oh, you're, you're getting all these likes. Are you on a high yet? <laughs> you get a high and then you wanna you do it again. You wanna post again, right? This is just an example. Um, but here's what happens at the level of the brain. You get the high, but immediately it subsides, leaving you craving for more. Now, this was evolutionarily useful. For example, you know, you had a meal, you wanted a meal, you had the meal, and then later you wanted another meal. That's good, right? That's how you survive. Same with sex. Like if you never wanted to have sex, you would not procreate, right? So th there, there's a reason why those highs don't last so long because you're needing to sort of 
um, for your survival's sake, um, continue to have those desires. However, in this day and age, the world has learned many ways to manipulate us to want to get more highs, right? Oh, that tasty chips or whatever. You know, if you look at ingredients in foods, um, it, you've probably seen like natural flavors and like, um, th they're all uh, taste enhancers to get you hooked, to get kids hooked, actually. A lot of kids, food has all that stuff in it. What is natural flavors? It could be any of a many, many chemicals that they don't tell you what it is, but they're actually not, but they're actually flavor enhancers to get you hooked. They're just an example. So that, that is one side, the hedonic happiness. Now, the eudaimonic happiness, that's a different happiness. What is, what is that? That is the happiness that is gained from a life of meaning, purpose. For some people who have a spiritual life, spirituality, service, altruism, compassion. While hedonic happiness is all about me, myself, and I, eudaimonic happiness is about something bigger than me. So whether that's spiritual or it's in service to others, like, like your teachers are doing for your kids, like you're doing in your community, like, like maybe you're doing for your neighbor, like whatever small act, it doesn't have to be, oh, I, I got to go to, you know, feed orphans in, you know, another country. No, approaching every day with the intention of just like, I just hope I make someone's day better today. I, I just hope I can, you know, spread a little warmth today, a little humor, whatever it is that your talent, whatever your talent is, you know, maybe a little cupcakes, whatever it is, right? So that intention is enough. The eudaimonic happiness, what kind of happiness does that, what does that look like in the brain? It's not a happiness that comes and goes very quickly. It's not a high that just bursts and leaves you craving for more. It's a sustained level of well-being. And that is so interesting. If you think evolutionarily, and actually Darwin said this, because actually we think that survival of the fittest was Darwin, it wasn't Darwin. It was one of his students who wanted to prove the superiority of certain races over others. Darwin actually said something more akin to those who will survive the longest are it's because of compassion. Look at us, we're so vulnerable and our skin, like we're so pierceable, like we, we don't have claws, nothing to protect us, right? If we don't have each other, we have nothing. And so it, it makes so much sense that we could only have survived because of compassion, because of love, because of service, because of, because of carrying the wounded off the battlefield, right? So eudaimonic happiness is that sustained happiness um, at the level of the brain. And I think we've all experienced that. I'm sure you've had that where you feel like you're having a crummy day, maybe you're stressed and whatever, something's not going right. Someone else calls you and they're like, oh, they just had a car accident or something. Like, can you pick me up on the side of the highway? And you're like, oh my God, and you jump to attention. You, you drive over there and you head over there and you're in total service to them. What happened to your crummy day? How are you feeling? You're not feeling crummy anymore. You're feeling energized. You're feeling positive. You're like all arms. You're all in, right? You're 100%. <laughs> Your whole state of mind shifts when you're of service, right? That's just one example. I think all of us have experienced that. In fact, we ran a study where we asked 300 people, what would what, what are, would you do if you had three days to live? <laughs> and what do people say? Service and time with loved ones and service. That was it. You know, it's like social connections. Like we know in our gut feeling that that's really all that matters to us, right? And by the way, service does not mean at a cost to yourself. We could talk about this more, but if it's at a cost to yourself, it's not service. We can talk about this more, Rosanna, if you want to, we can talk about this later. But anyway, that's how we can think of happiness, these two forms. And if you look at the cellular level, people who spend more time with the hedonic happiness, just always after the pleasures of the senses or of the ego, of the everything sort of to do with themselves, they have a very high inflammation rate at, at the cellular level, which is at the root, a root cause for many modern diseases. So, but if you look at um, people who tend to have more hedonic forms of happiness, they actually have very, very low inflammation rates. Whereas those who tend to have more hedonic uh, happiness, they have inflammation rates at the level, same level of as highly stressed people living through war. So very interesting. So that's one way we can think about it. That's great. Thank you, Emma. And I think, um, you know, I've been very public uh, with the community around um, my battle right now with cancer. And you said something that um, really resonated um, as you sort of face um, a chronic disease in that way, this concept of you know, that distinction between the two types of happiness. And, and um, when you're facing something like that, you come to realize what rises in this idea of service 
um, something bigger than ourselves um, and that need for social connection, how much it really does feed the soul um, when you're in the midst of strife and stress um, in, in the way that a, a chronic disease sort of you know, triggers all of that for you. So I can really, really appreciate that on a personal level. Why don't you talk to us a little bit, um, some of the questions we had parents um, uh, submit some questions and I'm gonna try and move through them. We, we have a handful of them. So just mindful of time as we, as we move through the next 40 minutes or so. And I wanna also leave time for some Q and A um, at the end. But as we think about um, this being an educative session for our parents, right? Like what, it, what does all that mean? The science of happiness and reaching this state of content what does that really mean for a parent in their parent role? What, based on everything that you know, what would you, what would you share with our parent community who was interested in joining this evening? Well, there's so much we could say, but here's what comes top of the mind for me at the moment. I'm a parent of two. Um, I think we've all, you may have noticed this in your own life. Look, things intergenerationally, we carry things. You, we know this, you know, trauma, for example, is passed down in our genes, right? People who went, uh, Jews who went through World War II's, uh, through concentration camps, so forth, you can see that genetic imprint in their descendants, right? So um, we know that, and we've probably seen this as well, for example, eating disorders, you know, if your mom had an eating disorder, chances you had one, you know, so what does that all mean? That means you can stop the generational stuff that's been handed down to you so you don't hand it down to your parents. This is so profound. I can tell you as a personal example, my grandmother had an eating disorder. My mom had an eating disorder. I had an eating disorder. And I realized at one point, the buck's got to stop here. It's got to stop here because I don't want my kids to have this. It, I'm going to stop this right now, right? We are not just ourselves. We are carrying a bundle of impressions and imprints of things that our parents believed were true and then told us, right? Um, one thing that many, many people struggle with is, a poor, is poor self-esteem, lack of self-love, lack of self-compassion. There's always this sense of just like not good enough, this voice inside the head that is just like, you're not good enough. Why aren't you doing this better? Oh, you didn't do that. Almost every single person that I've taught uh, has this, struggles with this. And I think, when is the buck gonna stop? How many generations of this are we gonna pass this down? Do we want our children to suffer from that the way we did? Now, it could be this, it could be something else. You know, you only know what it is in your case, but we owe it to our children to do the work, not just for our children, by the way, because when you can free yourself from those patterns, you free yourself. I mean, you're going to live from a whole different place. And similarly, how heartbreaking would it be if your beloved child says to themselves the things that you say to yourself, assuming that that is a pattern for you. Everybody's got it. You know, for some people, it's like an addictive behavior. Like, oh my gosh, like whenever I feel bad, I drink. Whenever I feel bad, I do X, Y, Z, whatever it is. You know, we all, we're just human. Like we're, we're all foibled, right? When we all struggle with different things. But the more awareness you can bring to your own patterns, the more the buck stops here. And that is so powerful. I think that's one of the, so that's why one of the greatest forms of love for your children is to love yourself, is to love yourself and to show them that you love yourself because you're taking care of yourself, because you're nurturing yourself. Now, and, and, and it also, like, having that awareness, what am I saying? What am I saying? Am I passing down? codependent tendencies, you know? Uh, the other day I found myself telling my son, don't do that. You know how so-and-so gets angry when, when we do that or you do that. Or, and I was like, what am I, what am I doing? I, I'm, I'm like training him for codependency of just like, oh, you gotta just change your behavior for everyone else. No, no. So that is uh, something uh, that comes to mind. But the question is, well, how do you gain awareness around your own patterns, you know? And here's, here's one way. I, I think the, one of the most profound ways, simple ways, cheap ways, is meditation. And at this point, you've probably heard a lot about meditation. Um, there is just so much research on how it benefits every aspect of your life that I'm telling you, if you have not given it a fair shot yet, please don't steal this from yourself. And I'm not saying, hey, meditate for the rest of your life. I'm saying meditate for at least 
40 days in a row and see for yourself what it does for you so that you can decide whether or not to continue. I knew that can seem hard. I remember the first time I meditated, I was like, oh my God. Plus I had a trauma after 9-11 and I was like, I, this is horrible. I'm so anxious. <laughs> I don't want to sit here. I'm just sitting with my anxiety. I ended up doing a, doing a breathing type of meditation called sky breath meditation that I ended up researching because it was so powerful for me <laughs> anyway. Um, but there are, you know, learn a technique that works for, for you. For me, it was that breathing practice. Um, but there's some great apps. I'm looking at my phone right now because there's an app I use every day. In addition to the breathing, I do, a I use an app. You basically turn it on and it meditates for you, right? You just sit there. So those are just a couple tips, Rosanna. How, how does that sound? I mean, I could, I could keep going on, but those are things that come to mind. Those are things I am thinking of for myself and looking around at the other parents I know, looking at my own family and looking at, that's one of the major things that I see. And I just wish if all parents loved themselves, we would raise a generation of very healthy children. Right. No, I can appreciate that. Thank you for that response and reminding us the importance of that self-awareness and suggesting meditation is one way to get there. We're in our schools focusing on social emotional learning. Um, that's yes. an initiative um, intervention and, and knowing that that proactive kind of giving all our kids a strong foundation in social emotional learning is critical. And, and one strategy and tool, as you know, even in schools and that's being really researched um, in the education arena for kids is, is how do we uh, foster mindfulness? How do we get kids to slow down? Again, raise their self-awareness. And what I'm, you're making me think about two things, the importance of our parents um, uh, raising their own self-awareness and modeling that model for their children, being compassionate and loving with themselves. And it also makes me think of when I get on a plane and the stewardess um, does the whole like emergency, if there's an emergency and putting the face mask on yourself first, right? Before you put it on the child, taking care of you first so that you can better take care of your children. So um, thank you for that encouragement, encouragement and reminder. Um, you know, we got a couple questions from parents specifically um, um, concerned about um, uh, our boys, our, 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 our young boys and, um, you know, uh, understanding that um, our, sometimes our boys are uh, misinterpreted um, by the world and, and by the school environment in particular around their energy levels, their physicality, sometimes that translates into um, disproportionately disciplining um, boys are feeling like they're not positioned for academic success because of their behaviors. So the question is just some, some information um, based on your research and your professional expertise on how some of this science, the science around happiness and uh, reaching that space of contentment, um, how it could, how it could uh, position parents to kind of support their boys and, and all of us as educators to better support our boys. Such a beautiful question. I'm a mother of two boys. Um, boy, do I know about energy. Um, you know, what psychology, I mean, the basics of what psychology, psychological research shows is that everything is a product of the individual plus the environment, right? If there's a problem, there's there's something going on here, right? It's not in the individual only. It's, it's a match. Is, the, is there a match between the individual and the environment? Now, boys do have a lot of energy, so much so, and that, that, that you see that testosterone and they're rolling on top of each other and wrestling and, and making certain demands for them to be physically sedentary for long periods of time may be challenging for some boys, especially. Now, I know there's not always a lot of options for that with, with in school systems, um, but uh, I know that our, we, we found, you know, we, 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 have, we do, have a school system where our, our boys can walk around in the classroom and um, move around and then they can go outdoors if they need to, to just sort of, you know, get some energy out. But I know that's sort of a unique uh, characteristic, but um, I, th I, I would say it, it's going to vary individual by individual. And if you see that one child is just needs to move more, is there an opportunity for them to do that? Um, so, or if not outside of class, can they just run? Can they just have that outlet? Because they are hormonally different. They are physiologically different. And they are at that age where they have the more energy than ever. And they're probably ever having their life, right? Is when they're young. So 
Yeah, so that's, uh, it's, it's a tough one, right? And at the same time, it's so important that that I'm just so, I mean, there's just so much sensitivity around it, I think, on the part of you, Roseanne, and your educators, and then of the families. And that's, that shows a lot of compassion right there. And yeah. yeah. And I love what you're saying about, you know, I love that about the individual, despite gender, right? Like any right. student who needs to move, um, any student who needs to, you know, find different ways to sort of express what's happening internally as they interface with the external world, um, us finding ways and spaces in school to be able to, you know, let them kind of metabolize that energy totally, um, while still meeting the expectations of school. That's, that's a complex challenge at school. And, you know, it's a complex, I'm a mom too, a 20 year old and a 15 year old. Um, and by the time they get there, you're starting to kind of figure it out, <laughs> but um, that, you know, eat at home, that that's all real too. Right. So just finding yeah. ways to, to make sure that they have their outlets. Um, maybe uh, even Oh, I was ahead. even thinking like maybe what we've done sometimes is just before school, they got on their bikes and they go around the block a bunch of times, you know, like just something. So even that, that start of day that can be so full of just like, you know, you just rested for so long. Like, yeah. Can we do, can we run to school? How about just jogging to school? You know, just experimenting. Yeah. Um, another um, question that came um, from our a theme of questions that emerged was, you know, our, our children are um, struggling right now with transitions. Um, they've been through so much in the last 18 months. And, you know, as families, um, we've spent a lot of time together um, in, you know, the, the whole quarantine. And, you know, we've been in close quarters together. Um, and I, I think parents have probably keenly tuned in to challenges that their children may have with transitions and change. Um, as kids had to move from, you know, regular school and the structured life that we knew pre-COVID and then moved and shifted into remote learning and then some came and hybrid learning and then now we're trying to, you know, persist and kind of push normal school back into um, our, our daily reality, but we still have the constraints and pressures of the uh, pandemic. So parents are really tuned in. I mean, I think parents in general knew that some kids ch are challenged by transition and change. But we're we're really really acutely tuned in these days because we've observed we've been observing our kids more because we've spent more time with them a hidden blessing probably of the pandemic. Um, again, any kind of um, any kind of advice that you have so sort of with your psychology background around helping kids manage these these micro transitions but also big macro transitions that they've been living um, through over the last eighteen months. Yeah. You know, they're going to do a lot better if you are a grounded, steady rock. Everything could be moving around, but you are so grounded, so steady, and carry so much peace inside of yourself that your child finds refuge with you. And when you're doing that, you model that for your child. If the parent is anxious, the child will be anxious. Children are more sensitive than adults, right? They just pick everything up, especially if they're in the smaller, I mean, small or not small, right? So the question is always, look, let's let me look at myself as a parent. Like, how steady am I? When my child comes home, is my mind all over the place or am I right there present? Before they go to sleep, am I in a calm state of mind or am I a mess? What are they feeling when they come home? Are they feeling peace no matter how crazy the world is? Because you create that aura of peace. Look, You've all had this experience where you've walked into a room, you're feeling fine, everything's going fine today. Someone walks in super anxious, all of a sudden you're stressed out. You don't know why, but you're stressed out. You're like, I don't know, there's all anxious, <laughs> right? Or you're feeling fine, somebody walks in and they're pissed off. You're like, what's with them? Two minutes later, you're flying off the handle. You're flying right back at them. Why? <laughs> Emotions are contagious. Viruses aren't the only thing that's contagious. Emotions are super contagious right? So again, this points again back to the fact, as a parent, how steady can you be? How much can you do your own work? How much can you do your own practices that take care of you so that you can be there for your child? Does this make sense? I, and this is something, you know, we, as parents, I think we're always just so focused on our children, just like, I just want them to be okay. But the children's looking at us, they're looking at us and they're like, why is mom freaking out about whether I'm okay, right? You know, the other day, it was, I was with my child and I was like, he's like, read me another book during dinner. And I was like, uh, well, mom hasn't had dinner yet. So I kind of have to have my dinner. And he's like, 
I don't like it when you don't take care of me while you're taking, well, I don't like it when you don't take care of you while you're taking care of me. It's so insightful, right? He's six years old. But again, that, that steadiness, um, emotions are contagious. If you can create steadiness within yourself, you will create a home that feels steady. And as such, it will be a home base where children will feel more settled no matter what's happening. I would say the other thing, which is more basic, is routine, a very steady routine that people can, they come home and they're like, oh, it's always the same. There's nothing crazy at home. There's nothing unsteady with what's happening. That's a very simple thing, but that can help. Great, thank you. Um, I want to um, shift and I uh, just kind of uh, on that note, um, you know, I'm going to be sort of vulnerable and candid. I, I grew up in a a first generation home, trans generational home, immigrant family. Um, there was a lot of distress, right? I was the first one born in the States. Um, we had economic um, challenges that I grew up with that were very real. We had um, different family members kind of, you know, living with us and then leaving and all kind of those transitions that I think are part of a lot of the um, immigrant um, reality at times. And some of the things that you're suggesting, like you know, that steadiness, that routine. Um, my parents worked and were outside the home. They left at, in, in the dark and they came home in the dark. I mean, I was yeah. most with my grandmother, for example. So that's just my personal way of connecting to kind of take us to a broader um, uh, a question around, you know, um, some families have resources and maybe can, you know, create that really easily, that steadiness that you're describing. And sometimes I know my personal experience is under distress. That's, that's sometimes more challenging. Um, do you have sort of any insights around, like, despite the conditions, you know, how can you move towards that is my first question. And then the second question connected to that is there was actually a question from a parent around, do these strategies work when your family is under distress and trauma um, or transgenerational trauma? So can you talk to us a little bit? Because I know you've done some work on trauma and, and yeah. kind of living within traumatic conditions. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Um, I've sometimes seen some of the most well-off families be some of the most dysfunctional and anxious. <laughs> so yeah. I do think, you know, even if a family doesn't, you don't see the child very much because there's so much, so much going in and out and working multiple jobs. If when you're with the child for 20 minutes of that day, you can just be 100% focused. And what I'm talking about with that inner calm, it has nothing to do with resources. It, it, that's why I'm talking about meditation. That's why I talk about breathing. Like just the little things where you calm your spirit. If you're spiritual, whatever your spiritual practice is, whatever it is that makes you feel grounded and centered. And that is something that we have all access to because it doesn't necessarily take a lot of time. It take, doesn't take resources. But I always think if you have, if you can get, come back to in, inner composure, you have all the wealth in the world. That's to me much more wealth and more useful than physical wealth is that inner peace, uh, especially in a time like this, because you can see people who have a ton of resources and they're still a complete wreck in this time because the resources don't are not going to help you, right? If you're in this in the pandemic, you know, it's not gonna make, I mean, it's not gonna make a difference in your state of mind, right? So I do think um, that brings me back to that. And the research we've done with trauma particular, we looked at breathing practices for veterans with trauma who had, for whom medicine had not worked, therapy had not worked. And we found that of all things of breathing practice, didn't just reduce their trauma. Many of them no longer had post-traumatic stress after one week of doing breathing exercises. There's a lot we don't know, and we have not heard about this. Why? Again, nobody's going to make a lot of money off of you breathing and meditating. <laughs> so no one's marketing it out there, but it's so powerful. And that's why I like to talk about it because it's something we all have access to. It's something we can all do. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, I think we've experienced this when you come home and you're finally with your kids, but you're not really with your kids because your mind is like, shh, 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 and you're like, oh my gosh. And your child is looking at you like, hello, are you there? Like, you're not paying attention because the child is present, but you're not. And it's like, well, I want to, but my mind is all over the place. So that's where like little centering practices, whether it's prayer, whether it's meditation, whether it's uh, whatever it is, you know, whether it's you're saying your rosary or just looking at the plants or breathing, you know, any of those things, if they center you and bring your mind back to the present, boom, you can be there with your child. And your child is like, oh, whenever I go to dad or whenever I go to mom, I feel calm around them. They make me feel safe because they're calm. I feel safe. 
That's great. I, I love the reminder for our parents that no matter what the stressful conditions may be, and we've all been dealing with our own kind of individualized, differentiated stress related to our own personal circumstances. And then there's this shared global stress that we're all living because of the pandemic. I love this reminder of we serve as the anchors for our children, right? And so again, going back to that self-awareness and ways that we can um, get to that space where, where we can be that um, positive, productive anchor. Um, and, and I love that some of the things that you're suggesting are like, you know, 20 minutes of your undivided attention, right? Where you're so present for that child who's, who's there ready to be present for you because that's their natural intuition is to connect with, with parents um, or caregivers, whoever may be in that role. Um, so related to that, there were some adult specific questions that I think relate to one of the major themes that you've been talking about over the last um, 40 minutes or so, which is, um, grounding yourself in, in service to your children. We're working around that with even our educators, right? How do we make sure that in this, these stressful times, our, our employees that interface with our kids every day are grounded so that they can be in better service to students? Because it's, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. And often kids can become the, the voiceless victims of our lack of groundedness, yeah. right? Um, so some adult specific questions that emerged are, you know, and I think I know what you're going to say, because you've said it a couple of times and maybe elaborate a little bit more. How can parents uh, manage uh, some of the work stress that they deal with in their professional lives? Um, whatever your job may be, we know work pulls parents away. It's a reality. Um, it's a reality in this country. We do not have 30 hour work weeks like in France. <laughs> we um, tend to lean more towards the 40 to 80. Um, how can parents manage that stress um, to be able to be more present for their children? Yes. Well, I'm going to go through a couple of practices that research have shown have really helped. But first, I want to dispel this myth also. Some of us absolutely have to work X amount of hours and X amount of jobs. No choice. That's fine. Some of us have bought into the idea that in order to be productive, in order to be successful, we have to work X amount and over the top and da da da. And we have to pay the price with our own health and well being. That is a well established norm out there, I would say. Quite well, doing very well in the Bay Area, I, I might add, having lived there for 10 years myself. Um, that is one of those things in your head where you can be like, oh, like maybe I can snap out of that because that doesn't belong to me. It's just a myth. It's a, it's a myth and it, it doesn't have to be. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I wrote my book because research shows that when, you, that when we burn ourselves into the ground like that to get things done, we're less creative, we're less emotionally intelligent, we make worse decisions, we're um, less present, less charismatic, we connect less with people and overall our results are not as good. And finally, our physical and, and mental health and uh, emotional health are impacted. What's the point, right? Sure, you might be super successful for a couple of years, then you find yourself burnt out. What's the point? Um, but sometimes it takes, you, know, you don't snap out of something until you realize it. You know how if you go to a different cultural context, like maybe you grew up in a bicultural family and so you're aware of two cultural contexts or you travel to another country or you travel to another state in America. <laughs> like I moved from California to Wisconsin. I'm like, whoa, different culture, right? You can go from one city, San Francisco to San Jose, you're gonna have a different culture. So whenever you move cultural context, I think the most interesting thing is to be like, huh, people don't do things the way I'm used to. Oh, that means that the way I've always done things isn't the only way, right? So that's, a, that's, a, that's one of the most wonderful things about getting your eyes open to that. So one thing I want to tell you is that myth that's out there, that you have to overwork yourself to, to be successful, to be productive, that you have to prove your worth through your work. A lot of people believe that you have to prove your worth through your work. Why do you have to prove your worth through your work? It's a myth. It's 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 healthy myth that's out there. It is doing well. You could you buy stock in that myth, right? It's not doing well for people, right? So that's a myth. That's a, that's just having awareness around that. Now, some of the things you can do in your life um, that research shows can help you get back to that grounded place. One is gratitude. It sounds simplistic. It's not. There's so much research behind it. Research shows that three times more positive things happen to us every day than negative. And yet, what do we focus on? Like, oh, uh, you know, you're having an okay day. You slept in a bed. You had a roof. You had your breakfast. You drove to work. And then you get a nasty email. I'm having a terrible day. It's like, really? You, really? 
one thing happened to you and you actually have all these amazing things happening to you that other people don't have. Like you slept in a warm bed with a roof and you, you know, you drink your favorite coffee at start, whatever, like those, we, we, you know, we, we have first world problems over here. So gratitude, what does gratitude do? It improves your well-being, your psychological well-being. It makes you more resilient. It improves your relationships. It improves your health. It improves your sleep. Uh, it's the list goes on. And this is so simple. You don't have to go around all day saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. You can if you want to, but even just reminding yourself before you go to bed, what are some three things I feel grateful for? One research study showed that just doing that, writing down three things you're grateful for was more effective than antidepressants for a major depressive disorder. So just an example. And that is just, and then once you start doing that, it becomes a habit. And all of a sudden you're just like, I'm just so, freak. you know, even when things are bad, you're like, yeah, things are bad, but geez, like I so much to be grateful for. That gives you so much strength. Um, it gives you so much strength and it makes you more realistic. You know, there's this, some people think that being cynical is more realistic. I don't think so. It's being grateful because there are more, more thing, good things happening to you daily than, than, um, than bad. So that's one thing. Um, we talked a little bit about service earlier, but if you can be of service every single day, not just you don't have to go out and do something, but just having that in your heart. Like, I just, I want to be a, a source of sunshine whenever I go anywhere, you know, and not like you have to make everyone laugh or anything, but just like when you walk in the room that there's just you know, positivity, upliftment, kindness, patience, the little things, right? So just having that intention of service, of altruism, of compassion, it has enormous effects on psychological health and physical health, not just that longevity longevity. So research, um, this one of my re favorite research studies looked at people who had been through major stressful life events like war. Um, usually those people live shorter lives. Why? Because stress, major stress shortens your lifespan. And so they were studying these people, but they saw, gosh, there's a subgroup of people. They're just like living and living. Like, who are these people? Like, why aren't they dying early? And they found that all those people in some small way were of service in their community. And it was like, it completely buffered the effect of the stress. I mean, that's powerful. It's so powerful. It's like, you didn't go through war. You know what I mean? It didn't matter that you went through war. You're still doing it. I can continue. Would you like me to continue with a few more? Yeah, when, um, I have one more question and then we're gonna open up these uh, last 10 minutes to uh, people raising their hands. So why don't you wrap that up? Okay. I mean, the other things I mentioned earlier, uh, breathing exercises, the sky breath meditation, I highly recommend for, for trauma and, and otherwise, and then meditation. Those are the things that I talked about. I mean, those are some of the, and then finally, this is the last one. This is another one you've probably not heard of because no one's going to make money off of you doing this, um, access to nature. Any little bit of nature has a huge impact on psychological well-being, but also cognitive function. Um, and also even in, on your relationships. And if you live in a city and you don't have access to nature, even just being in your city park or with your like street tree <laughs> has an impact. If you don't even have that, having plants in your home. So that's a little thing, but it has a very profound impact. As you can see, I've got plants everywhere. Um, but that, that is research you may not have heard about, but there's a ton of research on it. So that's great. Yeah, just good. totally resonating with me, Dr. Sepala, Emma, um, you know, as I... Um, uh, work towards remission. Everything that you're suggesting has been, um, you know, the advice, right? Nature, breathing, um, um, slowing down. And I'm actually on my second month of uh, writing a little gratitude list every night before I go to bed. And I have found it to be tremend tremendously useful to just appreciate all of those little things, um, especially in times that you're dealing with, you know, just, you know, you're in distress or, or, or challenge you really appreciate the little things and taking the time to write them down when you think about the course of your day, how many wonderful things happen moment to moment and hour by hour, that's personally resonating with me. So um, I say, uh, take her up on that tip, everyone. Um, it is really, really powerful. And again, that you don't need resources, just paper, pen and um, or pencil. And um, it's great. It's a great practice, I think, for kids to even think about, right? And start planting that seed early. Um, just the last thing before we open up the floor and hear some questions, um, we'll take some hands. Um, you know, you, you said this is the happiness track and you, in the book, you talk a little bit about success and how we define success. 
Um, and we, as we interface with families in the school system, this is always kind of a topic of conversation. Parents want their kids to do really well in school. We want our kids to do really well in school. We want them to have extraordinary post-secondary outcomes. I always say that I hope our K-12 system unleashes opportunity for kids, whatever that post K-12 opportunity is, depending on the student. I want at least for our system to be able to say that we weren't a barrier to that opportunity, that we were able to unleash and give kids the tools that they need to pursue whatever that opportunity may be for them that's going to make them happy and content in life. What, what, can you talk to us a little bit about you know, success and you know, advising parents on how to kind of manage that definition of success with their children? This is such an important question. I mean, look, I was an undergraduate at Yale. Um, I got my master's at Columbia. I did my PhD at Stanford. I now teach at Yale again. I've been on some of the most quote unquote successful campuses. And I can tell you what, most miserable campuses, okay? <laughs> Uh, filled with people who feel like they need to prove their worth by what they do, because otherwise they're worthless. It is truly what they believe. And so they will work themselves, be ruthless with themselves, ruthless, and ruthless with others sometimes too. I mean, sometimes that trickles into that. And then I remember going to University of Wisconsin-Madison for my postdoc and just being like, oh my gosh, like people are healthy here. <laughs> they're not, it, it, there's like, and this is a great school. It's obviously one of the top schools, but it wasn't, it's not, it, it's not considered like an Ivy or whatever. Um, but it was really interesting. And then to me, I was like, if it's the only place I bought a t-shirt from was the University of Wisconsin Madison, because I thought there's there's balance here. People are balanced, people are healthy, people are not just focused on themselves, they're also focused on their community. People are humble. Um, people care about their community. I, I thought, wow, that. If I want anything for my child is for them to be balanced because those are the adult, the ones that are gonna turn into healthy adults, balanced adults. Because what I see, well, anyway, so that's one observation right there. And I was teaching a, a class at Yale, a happiness class at Yale. And I asked them, you know, we're talking about success. And I said, well, think about, and I would like you to do that too, please, if you wouldn't mind, think about someone who was there for you unconditionally in your life at any point. Maybe they were a mentor to you, someone who, was there just for you at no, they didn't want anything, but they saw you for who you were and they were there for you hundred percent. So hopefully we can all think of at least one person in our lives who was like that for us. Now, if you were to think, what are some of the characteristics that that person had? You probably would say things like kind. You probably would say things like compassionate. You probably would say things like present, caring, loving. These inspiring, maybe whatever the, the words are, you can think for yourself, would you say these people have had a successful impact on your life? Absolutely. You still haven't forgotten them. They probably changed your life. To me, that is success. That is success. People who have sh shared their humanity with another person and been there for them. Does that mean we shouldn't teach our kids to, you know, um, strive academically and have goals and ambition? Yeah, sure, definitely. Why not? Let's do it. And if they have dreams of their own, so you know, support them in that. But, but be careful, I would say, not to let your own stuff push them in a direction that could lead to suffering. I'll give you an example here. I'm on the Yale alumni Facebook group, and um, somebody asked the question. I think I shared this story with you, Rosanna. Somebody asked the question, what would you share with... Um, what would you share? And so what's your profession and how would you advise someone who wants to go there? Simple question, right? It's probably for younger alumni who might be like, oh, I think I want to be a doctor. Like, how do I do it? You know, the answers were shocking. First of all, no one answered the question. Everybody just listed their profession and how much they hated it. And it was mostly physicians and lawyers. And they mostly were saying, don't do things for money and prestige. And I'm like, wow, 20, 30 years down the road. <laughs> they're putting this advice on Facebook, regretting their life, because they actually did something for external reasons, not from internal motivation. Maybe they wanted fame. Maybe they wanted reputation. Maybe they wanted power. Maybe they wanted money. Fine. Now they have it. They're miserable still. Right. So I think, you know, if your child wants that, great. If they're motivated from inside and they want it, great. But we have, I think we have to be really aware of just like our own ambitions and whether they match those of the child, the personality of the child. And also what's at the end of the day, really important going back to thinking of like at the end of the day, what kind of, what kind of impression do we want to have left? 
you know, what kind of, what do we want people to leave? Do we want them to think, oh, they made so much money or, oh, you know, no, that this stuff doesn't matter. It's like, oh, they were so kind. Like they were so, um, you know, they were, they were so inspiring. They were so whatever, right? Those are the things we actually care about as humans. So, so that is, you know, for myself as a mother, I, do I want my child to have the, you know, academic, everything that he wants academically? Absolutely. Sure. Do I want him to feel pressurized around it? No. I mean, if he were to be completely lazy, I certainly would uh, encourage him to work. But most of all, I want him to be kind. I want him to love others. I want him to love himself and grow up as a balanced human being who doesn't need to look outside of himself for validation, who knows who he is and who can show up in the world as his best, as his own very individual best self. So those are my thoughts on the topic. Thank you so much for reminding us that we want kids to connect with their passion, right? And that they they have a lifetime to kind of figure out what that is. Um, and a lot of the time we adults can get in the way of that um, and, and, and divert them away from what might be their true authentic passion and calling in this life. So thank you for that reminder. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna um, open it up. We just have a, a couple minutes. We're just gonna have a couple questions and then uh, we're so excited because we, um, for those of the, the those that pre-registered, we have a pre-draw, and so we have three winners who are going to raffle um, uh, who who won your book. So we want to announce that here at the end. But I'm going to go ahead and see if there's any um, questions. Uh, just a couple questions. We have a few minutes. Um, anyone who wants to uh, raise their hand and ask if Mr. Bassinet can help me with um, a couple questions from the audience tonight that I may not have covered. Um, so we do have a couple hands, Dr. Massetti. Okay, let's go with the first hand then. Okay. Uh, we have time for the two that are up. Let's let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so first person will be uh, initials A, B. Go ahead with your question. Oh, they put their hand down. Um, okay, let's go with the next person, uh, Nav. Go ahead with your question. You'll need to unmute yourself. Hi, Nav. Do you have a question? Muted. Staying muted. Maybe the hand was an accident. Are you going to unmute, Nav? Nope. Hands down. Looks like AB's back up. We want to give him one more try. Mr. Yeah, Bassett. let's try that again. Oh. Nope. Hand down. Okay. Any anyone else out there? Um, Okay, let's let's try this next one. Cache Rocker. Go ahead, you can talk. Uh, okay. Hi. Um I just wanted to um some advice from you guys when it comes to um, you know, emotion. Um, you know, what type of pointers do you have like breathing okay. techniques right. and Great. things like that? Yeah. Um yeah. What type of uh, like recommendation, like, you know, probably like uh, snacks or drinks or something to, you know, to calm um, mm -hmm. your nerves during a crisis like this, like COVID and things like that. Mm -hmm. Just like this vent, this transition that we have. Uh, Cache, thank you so much for asking, uh, asking that important question, which by the way, I think everybody probably has because no one's ever taught us how to handle our emotions. That's the irony. Like we're all walking around as adults, but on the inside, we've never been taught how to handle our emotions. And I could go into all the science of it, but I, won't, I don't want to spend too much time, but most of us suppress our emotions because that's the only thing we've ever learned. And it doesn't really work out for us at all, right? So how to manage anxiety. I definitely think that breathing practices are going to be the fastest, most efficient way of doing that um, because uh, it goes right into your physiology and it calms your, your fight or flight, your, your stress response. And as you do that, um, you regain the ability to think clearly. So I can tell you a quick story of, of my husband's friend who uh, he was in a, in, a, in a bomb in Afghanistan. Um, he was in a Humvee uh, as a Marine Corps officer. And um, in that, that moment, he was actually um, a very severely injured, very severe. And when he, when he opened his eyes, he saw everything. And um, he remembered a breathing exercise he had learned in a book that trained young officers about what to do in a time of wartime crisis. And because he did that breathing exercise, he was able to save his own life. Um, he would have um, died 
if he had not done the things he did and was able to maintain a sort of presence of mind. So, but we've, I've done a lot of research with my colleagues on breathing and it's in this time and age of like, we want results and we want them now, we want them fast and we want them to work. <laughs> breathing is gonna be your best friend. Um, I highly recommend looking into the sky breath meditation a program. It's like a three-day class. Um, there's probably some YouTube stuff, but I wouldn't do that because I don't know what that is and I can't guarantee what that is, but you can take, it's like a three-day class um, uh, through Art of Living. Um, uh, and, and that's really um, very useful. That's what our research has shown. Um, but if you want a really, really simple breathing practice, just like right now, I'm just going to share with you that like when you breathe in, your heart rate increases. When you breathe out, it decreases, slows down. So if you breathe out longer than you breathe in, you're going to calm yourself down. So not that you should do that every minute of the day, but if you start your day, say with five minutes, where you're breathing in for a count of four and breathing out for a count of six or eight, and you do that for five minutes, <coughs> you can immediately start to notice yourself calming down. You can do that periodically during the day. It's the fastest way for you to physiologically calm yourself. And then I would definitely try and add in some meditation um, using an app. Like the app that I use is called, um, S -A it's Sattva, S-A-T-T-V-A. That's just my personal favorite. But this could be so, so useful. Um, and please feel, you know, feel free to, after this call too, if anyone has, has further questions, I hope you will feel free to email me them. But yeah, uh, Kesha, I, I'm really glad you asked that question because most, most human beings do not know how to handle their emotions. It's just a fact. We've never learned it, right? We learn all these things in, in our education, you know, in our homes and in our jobs, but we, that's one thing that they forgot. Most people, although not, not Rosanna, not in your school, socio-emotional <laughs> learning. <laughs> well, we're working on it. So I appreciate uh, <coughs> Ms. Rocker. Thank you so much for your question and joining us here tonight. That is the reason, right? Um, uh, us as adults, um, a lot of what we've covered over the last hour, we don't have the strategies for regulating our emotions. And it's not something that schools historically, when all of us were getting educated, focused on. Um, in fact, you know, the opposite was true, right? Schools in many ways have lots of tactics kind of woven into their infrastructure to actually suppress emotion. And so right now we know, and especially in today's world, you know, we knew it pre-pandemic, but now it's almost like um, the sense of urgency in, the, in this pandemic environment and what we've all experienced globally. Um, we know that um, we have to disrupt that in our schools, right? And it's, it's helpful when homes and schools are working in partnership and on the same thing. So as we advance our socio-emotional learning curriculum um, across our K-12 public schools here in Napa Valley Unified, it's great to think that we're planting some seeds with parents tonight who can also think about incorporating some of these strategies um, in the day-to-day -day at home. Um, and kids will see that alignment and that'll position them for um, more success. So um, we are, are out of time. Um, I, I wanna be respectful of time. Do you mind, um, Dr. Sepulov, we just maybe take one more question. Um, is that okay? I, I know we've got a time limit here, and, um, but we'll take one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, Nariman Mazuni, if you can unmute, we'll take your last question for the evening. Yes, hi everyone. Thank you so much for this great meeting. So um, I just want to, uh, to talk about myself and um, I'm a mom of four and three of them are in elementary school. So the oldest is nine. And sometimes I'm just overwhelmed and I'm trying to put, um, I see that I, I put some uh, pressure on my kids to, like you said earlier, just to make them um, succeed. So for me, the success is just uh, make them uh, great and uh, excellent in all the all the sites. And myself, um, immigrant, so I'm still learning the language, still learning everything about the country. So that's why sometimes I just find myself um, overwhelmed. And like you said too, that we have to take care of ourselves first, but sometimes I don't have time to manage um, the new habits, for example, when I'm trying one, I just um, leave it and, and try second one and it's the same thing. So if you have some advices for me, how to keep going and, and not make a lot of pressure on my kids. And thank you. Thanks for the question, Nariman. I think that 
the fact that you don't want to put that much pressure on them anymore is enough like that you have that awareness now you can even have a conversation about it I mean I, I have a close friend who's also um a first generation here she in fact um has only recently uh gotten a work permit so she's been under the stress of not being legal for many years and she has two kids she put enormous amount of stress on them and never realizing that now that they're in their teens, how that impacted their relationship, you know, so it's really good that your, 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 your awareness is enough now. Uh, and you can start having, especially if you have teenagers and stuff, start having conversations with them around this, look, uh, and just engaging with in conversation around this, you know, what your hopes and fears are for them. And at the same time, understanding that they're going to come from a different place. Um, but yes, in terms of habits, dropping them, taking this up, dropping it. I, I mean, you have to see for yourself. For me, I was not regular with meditation until I took a class. And also because meditation didn't really work. I had too much anxiety after 9-11. I was in New York during 9-11. And so I had all this anxiety um, that I had to take. So I took that breathing class that I mentioned, the sky breath meditation class. And that was like, okay, I learned this thing. I'm going to do it for 40 days. I'm going to see if it works for me. But for yourself, you could also just decide any, any time bound vow is good, right? 30 days, 40 days a time bound vow. If you tell yourself, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, you're never going to do it, right? If you tell yourself, I'm going to do this for this period of time, if it works for me, I'm going to stick with it. If it's not, boom, it's going out the window. I'm going to try something else. So try that. If 30 or 40 days just seems way too long for you, 10 days. But in the process, observe your day. How's my day going? Am I a little bit more aware? Am I a little bit more calm? Am I sleeping a little better? I, I mean, I'm a scientist. So I I don't really believe things until, until, unless it's a product of my own experience. And I encourage you to do the same. Be like, you're your own laboratory. You're your own lab. So thank you, um, Ms. Mizuni Nerman, for your question. So with that, um, uh, yeah, I want to close. I, I, I thought of a relevant quote. Um, this might resonate with some of what you've talked about, especially in this last part of our hour, um, Emma. Um, a quote from... Um, Dr. Or Carl Jung, famous psychologist, the greatest burden a child must bear is the unlived lives of its parents, right? So thinking about sort of that, how heavy and deep that is um, and how often I know, you know, I experienced that. My parents made a lot of sacrifices to come to this country. And so I felt like an obligation around so many things and, and what a burden that can be. It can serve as a motivation, but there's a tipping point. And so that awareness and that mindfulness. And I loved Emma's suggestion around just even um, being authentic and vulnerable with your kids around the fact that you are aware and that you're struggling with passing that burden on can open up really powerful conversations with our kids. So honest, candid conversations around what we're struggling with. Um, uh, we have a trustee, trustee Wa, Cindy Water, um, one of our seven trustees who's a big fan. She's a former English teacher in our system and now she's on our school board and does an amazing job along with her six colleagues. Um, but she just gave me something simple via text is to remind everybody to breathe in four and exhale six. And I think that goes to your point, um, Emma, just uh, make sure you're extending that breath out a little longer than that breath in. And that, that's something really simple, right? Just trying that daily or multiple times during the day, um, plant those seeds. So, okay. Um, so who are going to be the winners of tonight before we say goodbye to Emma, who I know is not feeling well. I want to thank her for persisting with us. Um, so we have three winners that won the draw. Our communications um, department will be arranging book delivery um, to these parents. So um, our first winner, I hope she's on here, um, Ashley Tensher. Um, uh, is a winner of the book. So we'll, we'll send you um, Dr. Seppala's The Happiness Track. Also, we have um, Julianne, Julianne Pina, um, who was the second winner. And our third winner is Felix uh, Badola. Um, so if I um, mispronounced, uh, please accept my apologies, but our communications team will be following up and getting those books in the hands of our winners for the pre-draw. So um, we had uh, uh, over 150 parents on tonight, so I want to thank everybody um, here in the Napa Valley Unified School District. We want to continue to inspire you with thought leaders and authors, not only for our children, but also for our adults that, that are around our children. Um, 
during school and after school, our families and our educators. And so I'm um, Dr. Seppel on behalf of the Napa Valley Unified School District. We wanna thank you uh, for joining us this evening and being with us tonight and sharing your wisdom and all of your professional and personal expertise around this critical topic. My pleasure, thank you. All right, good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us here um, for this great evening in the Napa Valley Unified School District. Have a wonderful night.